I'm going to lead us in an opening ritual to get us started. This is coming from work out of the Strozzi Institute for Embodied Leadership. And it's going to help us gather ourselves in four dimensions of height, breadth, depth, and center. So it'll take about five minutes. Um, so feel free to sit in a chair or on the floor or stand if you'd like. Whatever will be most comfortable for your body and spirit. <clears throat> And when you're ready, I invite you to close your eyes if you want. And we'll begin by taking a few long breaths. So we'll inhale and exhale slowly. And inhale and exhale slowly. Just find a pace that works for your body. Now find your height in your body. Feel your spine stacked over your body and under your head. Feel the structure it offers. Now imagine putting a little bit of air in between each vertebrae. As you do this, relax down the length of your body. Loosen your jaw. Find your throat clear and open and drop your breathing into your stomach. If you encounter tension or discomfort along the way, send some breath to support the tight area. And as you settle into this dimension of height, find a balance between holding your head up and grounding down into your seat and feet. And feel the dignity of your being in your length the uniqueness of your existence and your body on earth at this moment. And next we'll move into the breadth dimension, so keeping your shoulders and jaw relaxed <coughs> since the right and left sides of your body. Maybe sway or move a little bit from side to side if you like. Since the people to your left and right, these humans who have chosen to be here with you, Follow your sensing to other people present in the building, those moving past outside. Every person with their own life experiences and identities that shape their movement and their path. And continue sensing the trees, pine and cedar, crab apple that surround this building, grasses, shrubs, and flowers. And listen to the winds animating them all. And expand your sensing to the Charles River. The oaks, the willows, and sedge on its banks. The geese guarding the esplanade. All the water dwellers of the river. These creatures, human and non-human, are companions in this place. And as you find yourself amidst the web of life, Connect to how you connect with others. Without losing your height, feel into how you will be in this space today. What will you bring? How do you want to take up space? Next, we'll move into the depth dimension. You can lightly press into your heels or your tailbone and feel into the backside of your body Maybe placing a hand on the lower back or sacrum, if you like. Can you sense those who came before you in your lineage? Those whose stories, strength, and resilience through generations brought you here now in this body? Connecting with depth, we can honor those that came before us in our own heritage and in the heritages of this place. We can name and honor the Meswachu Aset people as the historical keepers of this land. And then we can feel into what is before us. We can lightly press into your toes, placing a hand on your stomach just below your navel if you like, maybe even leaning slightly forward. We can imagine future beings and generations. Sense your heart's needs whether it be for openness or boundaries, and ask whose stories will we center going forward. 
And finally, we'll tune into our center. It's that place in our guts from where intuition arises. It's that place where we know our purpose. You can feel your center of gravity in your belly, maybe behind or below your navel. Keeping your eyes and shoulders relaxed and staying tuned into your height, breadth, and depth, you can ask, for whom am I here this morning? Allow answers to arise. And you can return your awareness to your breathing, taking a few more deep breaths. And then slowly return your awareness to the room. You can open your eyes if they've been closed or wiggle some fingers and toes. Thanks for showing up as your full selves this morning. Thank you for that, Anna. My name is Becky Kirkland. I am an assistant professor of theology here at BU School of Theology. And uh, I am the director of the newly formed Faith and Ecological Justice Program. And I was delighted when Dr. Olson asked if we would like to co-sponsor this year's Religion and Conflict Transformation Retreat. And so I'm really delighted to be here with you all today, and I wanted to say welcome, and we're all going to get lots of chances to talk together some more. But uh, Judith, I believe, wants to say welcome as well. So welcome. So pleased to have all of you here. I'd, I'd also like to thank Anna and Mike for that ritual opening. and. Um, in a minute, I'm going to encourage you to, um, some of you who are in the way back, to move up into the uh, front circle here so you're not so far away. Uh, it's very exciting to finally have this day come and to be working with Dr. Copeland. I want to give a special welcome to our students who are in the RCT program from our other BT, BTI schools. Um, Hans and Andrew, would you stand up? Rachel and Killian? Yeah, so um, it's great to have you all here, and it's always enriching to have students from the other BTI schools uh, join us. Thank you. Special welcome to Bishop Susan, ha Susan Hassinger, who is one of the members of our RCT leadership team, and also teaches a number of courses for the RCT program. And I'd like to bring greetings from Dean Moore, who couldn't be here today. She's uh, at a conference in Toronto. Uh, and extend especially special appreciation to the RCT staff, Mike Menino, who's in the back, and Rose Percy, chair of the hall. Rose, because Rose and Mike handled so much of this conference and all the details and the beautiful program and so much more, really appreciative to them. Also, Megan Berkowitz, who works with um, Dr. Copeland, also contributed, and, uh, but could not be here today. So quickly, our intention for the day. The annual RCT retreat is an important time to come together, build community, get to know each other, and bring in some outside resources to dig more deeply into one area of conflict and creatively explore possibilities for transformation. We are pleased to have collaborated with the new Faith and Ecological Justice Program, and I want to congratulate Dr. Copeland for developing this important certificate program here at SDH. Conflicts get mediated in lots of different ways, and the field of environmental justice examines how conflicts are conducted over, in, over environmental resources, but also how conflicts over other issues get mediated through the environment and impact the environment. Um, so by partnering with the Religion and Conflict Transformation Program today, we hope to be able to develop skills to take beyond just examining these issues um, and into the transformation of these conflicts for the betterment of all of the parties involved and the world that we all share. So as you're well aware, our Earth is in imminent danger and we're grasping for personal and collective responses that can make a difference. Conflict occurs at every level, even those in faith communities differ on cause, impact, and effective strategies. And ironically, it is conflict that can actually transform 
us and the process, calling us to search within, to wake up to God's holy presence and creation, and challenging each other to collective action. We'll hear today from international experts this morning and local activist pastors this afternoon, but we want to start with Dr. Copeland leaving a leading us in a process to talk with each other. We would invite uh, those of you who are comfortable to come forward into the circle. Uh, if you would like to remain at the table, just make sure you're at a table with two or three other people. All right, so our first question for this morning is, how do you divine, define environment? What's the environment? Are we, are we doing this like in class where we talk about it? Right now, yeah. <laughs> so for this, moment, it, for this moment, it is the first 10 minutes of introduction to Christian traditions. All answers are welcome. How do you define environment? Nature. Nature. Place. Place. Where you are. Where you are. Ecosystem. All right. We get more answers on intro. Yes. Living in, living with. Living in and living with. You had your hand up? No. The physicality of the creation. The physicality of the creation. I love these answers. Yeah, Amy. Living in a biosphere. Living in a biosphere. Excellent. Home. Yeah. Context. Context. And home. Home. Excellent. So some of you may be aware that for a long time, environmentalism didn't seem to converse very much with social justice movements. That there was this understanding that the big conservation groups were understanding nature and the environment as that pristine area in which we might vacation but not the places that we live. Yeah. Um, and what we're gonna be talking about a little bit this morning is bringing that into conversation with work that you all have clearly already done, the environments that we actually inhabit on a day-to-day -day basis. And so looking at environment as it gets defined by the environmental justice movement is talking about the places where we live, work, and play. And then bringing that into faith context, we also talk about where we worship. And then bringing it into educational environments, we also talk about the places where we learn. And then, and I had a great experience with this this morning, also the ways that we move in between them. How do we transport from one of these places to another? And so thinking about environment not just as the Acadia National Park when we get to go out there for a trip, but also as this room as Commonwealth Avenue and the street along which we walk, as well as the Charles River and everything else that we're experiencing. <coughs> so, first small group work. I want you to get in groups of three or four people, or if you're at a table, you can do it with your whole table. And I want you to first, first is personal reflection, pick one of your environments, where you work, or where you live, or where you play, or study, or worship and consider your environment. Consider the environmental hazards that you're exposed to or the environmental benefits that you enjoy. Think about your light, air, the temperature, the water that you have available. Do you have access, access to bathrooms? What sort of foods do you have access to? What is your safety and how do these environments contribute to that? So take about 30 seconds to think about your environment and then share with your table or with your small group. All right. So can I get a quick show of hands? Did anybody name access to drinking water as one of the hazards that they face? Yeah. Yeah. Couple, three hands. Yeah. Does anybody here get drinking water from a well? people. Um, did anybody name toxic waste dump in my neighborhood as one of the environmental hazards that they face? 
I do. You do? In a way. Pardon? I did in a way. In a way? Yeah. Um, a homeless person at a facility downtown has been using uh, a porch as a bathroom, and mm. it's a public health concern. So people who are using the neighborhood as a restroom. Yeah. So what I want to do now is take this, take your personal reflection in the conversation with a case, the case that launched the environmental justice movement as it's known today. And that is the case of Warren County, North Carolina. In 1978, there was a company, the Ward Transformer Company, that had to get rid of PCB waste, poly polychlorinated biphenyls. And it's very expensive to dispose of this material properly. And so instead of paying to dispose of this material properly, they dumped it illegally along the sides of the highways as they drove around North Carolina at night. Now, for this behavior, Buck Ward and his son were jailed. It was criminal. They were put in jail. But then North Carolina had the problem of acres and acres and acres and acres of contaminated soil that they had to clean up. And so they did. They spent millions of dollars getting the soil from along all of these highways, but then they had to put it somewhere. And they did not have a designated toxic waste dump for depositing this material. And so they decided that they were going to locate it in Warren County, North Carolina. Um, they designated Warren County as the toxic dump site. Warren County is a place that had a population of 18,000 people. Only 31% of that population was white, and over 20% of that population lived below the poverty level. Now, the government stated that this was a, a good location geographically for a toxic waste site. The residents of Warren County said, absolutely not. We get our drinking water from wells, and the water table is too high. This endangers us with toxic waste, and argued that instead, their location was chosen because they were deemed to be politically impotent. That they would not be able to raise the ruckus that another community would be over having a toxic waste dump site located in their homes. Um, and so this led to contracted uh, legal battles and ended with, in 1982, when the trucks with the toxic waste were rolling into town, a mass demonstration led by environmental activists, Warren County residents, and civil rights activists, in which, to a large extent, women and their children were lying down in the road in front of these trucks trying to prevent this waste from being brought into their community. They lost in one way. The dump was absolutely located there, and the materials were put there, and ongoing legal battles have waged over the ensuing decades about cleaning up and detoxifying those wastes. But in another way, this launched the environmental justice movement. A year later, the GAO report, issued a report on toxic waste. Um, they looked at the toxic waste sites in the southern United States and found that of the four toxic waste dumps in the southern United States, three were located in communities of color. This was followed up by a, pro by a program of the United Church of Christ the Commission on Racial Justice did the study and published uh, Toxic Waste in the United States in 1987, studying all of the toxic waste sites throughout the United States, including incinerators and other health hazards like that, and found that statistically, communities of color and communities of low income are disproportionately impacted by the locations of such environmental hazards. And that when you correct for income, there is still a, a bias against people of color. And so this was issued in 1987. It has since that time been updated again and continues to find the same thing. The results are debated in public policy discussions about whether the sites are located amongst communities of color or communities of color come to the sites because the land is so cheap because it's hazardous. Um, but either way, this is showing the disparate impact of these environmental hazards on different communities. 
And Reverend Dr. Ben Chavis, uh, who was instrumental in that study on toxic waste and race, defined and coined in that report the term environmental racism. And so environmental racism, as he defines it, is the existence of clear patterns which show that communities with greater minority percentages of the population are more likely to be the sites of commercial hazardous waste facilities. The possibility that these patterns resulted by chance is virtually impossible, strongly suggesting that some underlying factors which are related to race played a role in the location of commercial hazardous waste facilities. Therefore, the Commission for Racial Justice concludes that Indeed, race has been a factor in the location of hazardous waste facilities in the United States. So, where we place environmental hazards, where we make sure we have environmental benefits, where do we have beautiful green spaces, where do we have ample access to resources that we need, these things are not simply decided based on environmental uh, utility, but also based on the makeup of the communities where these things are located. But how you make these decisions are very complex issues. One of the terms that I like to talk about, and I did before I came to Boston, is wicked problems. And this term, wicked problems, is not trying to use old Boston slang, but is, was coined in the realm of public policy to talk about problems that are utterly complex. They are so complex that the parties involved don't simply disagree about how to describe or characterize the problem, they disagree about what the problem itself is. And so these are some of the characteristics of wicked problems, but when you're talking about these environmental conflicts, you're talking about problems that are irreducibly complex in this way. And so I wanted to take a minute because Warren County seems like, I mean, it is such a shocking case study but I want us to take a minute to unpack the complexity of a wicked problem. And so I want you to get into groups of three, and I want one of you to consider the perspective of Buck Ward, the owner of the company that initially dumped the PCB, uh, contaminated stuff all over North Carolina. How would he define the problem that he was facing? I want the second person to take the perspective of the state of North Carolina the state that now has acres and acres and acres and acres of contaminated topsoil. How would they define the problem that they are facing? And then the third person, take the perspective of a citizen of Warren County. How would you define the problem that you're facing? So if you could take about three minutes to consider those, those three different perspectives and discuss how you would define the problem from each. All right, so can I hear from a citizen of Warren County? A citizen of Warren County, what's the problem? How do you define the problem as a citizen of Warren County? They're dead, they can't die. They're not dead, they're actually still here. <laughs> Joe, you are still alive. You now have terrible diseases. Citizen of Warren County, what's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? <laughs> How were we chosen? How were we chosen? And why were we chosen? And why were we chosen? Yeah. Beth. Uh, why don't we have a voice? Feeling powerless. Why, why didn't we have a voice in this? Why are we powerless in this decision? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with something a little more basic. Don't poison my water. I get my water from a well. And you're going to come and dump toxic waste in my community? Don't put, that's how I'm defining this problem. Don't poison my water. Give me a voice. Let me have a voice in deciding where you put this. And it's not going in my yard. All right. How about the state of North Carolina? How would you define the problem? Yeah. Um, someone did something and now we have to deal with it. Somebody did something illegal, and now we have to deal with it. Yeah. It costs a lot of money to deal with it that we don't necessarily have because our citizens are taxed very heavily. It costs a lot of money that we don't necessarily have. We were not planning on spending millions of dollars to detoxify soil because somebody was illegally dumping carcinogens. <coughs> we don't want to lose the company because they employ a lot of people. 
We don't, want, we don't want to lose a company because they employ a lot of people. Economic issues that go into decision making. Yeah. Uh, we don't want our transportation infrastructure being messed up. We don't want our transportation infrastructure being messed up. Stop dumping garbage on our roads. Yeah. We have to put it somewhere, so we might as well put it in a community where there's not a lot of people, where the least amount of people will be we have to put this somewhere. We have it. We have to put it somewhere. So why not a sparsely populated community where there's not a lot of people to be impacted? All right. How about Buck Ward? I know you went for it. <laughs> it's too expensive for me to take care of this properly. And I know I should. But if I do, I, I'm going to go out of business. It, all the people I've employed are going to be out of jobs. How do I get rid of this thing that's overregulated that it's so expensive for me to get rid of and I've got to hold on to my company? I'm a capitalist. I need to look out for my shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking out for my shareholders and my son. I think it was Ward and Sons or something. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Well, things aren't consistently enforced. Things are not consistently enforced. I'm not sure how serious this regulation is. I know that there's a regulation against it, but it's not always enforced. And um, I mean, do I have a vested interest in not thinking that PCBs are as bad as some people say? I mean, I work with them. My employees work with them. Do I have a vested interest in thinking perhaps they don't really need to be disposed of in the really safe way? So thinking about this, this is the idea of considering how different people look at a problem differently um, before we even get to analyzing the conflict. And while this is a regional issue, it scales up as well. Um, thinking about what we know about climate change. What causes climate change? Do we know about climate change? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> oh my. What causes climate change? Behavior. Behavior. What particular behavior? Pollution. Pollution. The, the production of greenhouse gases. Yeah, which comes from the burning of fossil fuels and other sources as well. But thinking about that, um, and then what do we know about climate change and who it affects? More and more people. Yeah, it affects everybody, but who does it affect the most and the soonest? is the people who tend to have the least resources to adapt to it. And so, th yes, the global south. So thinking about the effects of climate change, how is climate change a source of environmental injustice? Well, if it's affecting the people with the least resources to deal with it first and soonest, then that itself is a case of injustice. But if we think about the causes of climate change, how is that? evidence of environmental injustice? How is climate change itself evidence of environmental injustice? Who's burnt all those fossil fuels? Bug Ward. <laughs> Bug Ward. <laughs> he, was, he was burning some absolutely as he was driving around North Carolina at night. But where, where does he live? In the, the, in the United States. Industrialized countries that have built their wealth off of the burning of fossil fuels have put the majority of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so you have disproportionate uh, use of what could be called a global commons, that the West and the Northern Hemisphere and the industrialized countries have made use of and built wealth and resources which they can use to adapt to climate change. And you have the impacts being felt most severely in the countries that have done the least to uh, cause it. And so that's about as far as I'm going to go on this topic. But we're going to be able to uh, call upon an expert in our next section to talk a bit more about this. So actually, if you want to go ahead and put your hand. We are delighted to be welcoming Dr. Adil Najam, who is the inaugural dean of the Frederick S. Party School of Global Studies at Boston University, and also a professor of international relations and of earth and environment. 
Earlier, he saw, served as the Vice Chancellor of the Lahore University of Management Sciences in Lahore, Pakistan. And his research focuses on issues of glo global public policy, especially those related to global climate change, South Asia, Muslim countries, environment and development, and human development. Dr. Najam was a co-author for the third and fourth assessments of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, work for which the IPCC panel was awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. He serves on multiple international boards, including as a trustee of the World Wildlife Federation, the world's largest conservation organization. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Adil Najam. Thank, thank you very much, Becky. Thank you for, for, for having me. Thank you for, for doing doing this. This is this is amazing. Uh, and I turned it off by accident. Uh, thank you for, for having um, having this workshop. Thank you for talking about these things and thank you for having me. Uh, I was delighted when Becky asked me to come back and and, and kind of repeat the <laughs> talk that I had given some time ago. Obviously, I didn't do a very good job of getting the point across. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so for those of you who, who, yes, no, uh, some, of, some of this, a few of you have heard before. But also more than that, uh, Mary Elizabeth Moore is not here. But for those of you who don't know, when Dean Moore asks anyone at the university to do something, uh, there are not two possibility answers. There's only one. Uh, so it's not like I had a choice. But, uh, but I am delighted. I'm especially delighted because uh, because uh, you have uh, uh, convinced uh, Professor Suskind to be here, and, and so that puts a lot of pressure on me. Um, Professor Suskind was my uh, my not just my dissertation advisor, but has and remains a, a mentor. So uh, so that puts pressure on me. But more than that, anything that I say that is wrong uh, must really be his fault. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, uh, much of this comes from there. I want to take 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 the few minutes and and talk about um, the environmental justice and take exactly from where uh, where Becky le left on the global side. I'm not going to say much about religion as 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 I think I had mentioned before. The only thing that I will say about religion is my name, um, which is which I think is relevant to this context. Uh, the name is Adil, the first name. Adil comes from the Arabic word Adil. Adil in Arabic and Turkish means justice. Uh, Adil is, means the just. Uh, as in, me, in my case, as the just being stupid, but in other cases, the one who is just, it's one of the 99 names of God, the attributes of God in the Muslim tradition. So I tell that partly because I did have to say something about religion to this crowd, and partly because I think it, 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 it behooves uh, the topic and, and also gives context to this being a subject that is really of grave and great concern to me, the justice aspect of everything but this. Um, one last thing on context, and then I'll move. And, and, and that is, it was wonderful that you started with, with the case that you did. Uh, because I first um, uh, read, talked, heard about it when I was a graduate student in Mike Wheeler's class, uh, when this was everywhere. And one of the things that, that used to come out of, uh, thank you, uh, one of the things that used to come out of that is take a map of the United States, put all the toxic sites on it, and you've just created a map of uh, minority communities in the US. Uh, and that exactly, in some ways, is the climate conversation that happened then uh, and, and what I want to talk about. So I take my job today as essentially sort of giving you a very quick run through the climate question as a justice question. And uh, then we shall move from there if I can get any of this thing to work. OK. So uh, this is that, that's fine. So I have three three questions uh, that I want you to think about but not answer. Thank you very much. Um, these are not the type of questions you can answer. And if you did, and I promise not to answer them either, because if you did, uh, we'll have nothing to talk about. Uh, <laughs> just, just give me one second. And if not, I'll just, just do it the old fashioned way. Let me just do it the old fashioned way. So the first question is, I, I want to talk a bit about, or you to think about, what does global mean? Right? We, we use this term all the time. 
uh, global climate, global finance, global terror, Hakuna Matata, everyone together. Uh, but if in fact, if in fact as a policy concept it is real, what does that mean? What does that mean in a context of a world where a lot of things are global in terms of how we think about wicked policy problems? So that's thing one I want us to think about. Second, and this is going to be the bulk of what I want to talk about, is this claim that I've been making for at least uh, now 10 years, I think it's become less and less um, uh, unusual, but, but certainly is still, that we are living in what I call the age of adaptation. That we should stop talking about climate as a future issue, which we were when I started. And in some ways, I think it is not just a mistake, but very dangerous to keep doing that. Because <coughs> by my calculation, for at least about a third of the planet, which is about two and a half billion people, climate change is a real issue today. Now, I think we keep talking about it, we meaning climate folks, as a future issue, because we think if we don't, people will give up. And you have to have some hope of being able to change something. But in that, we may be actually missing not just real policy changes that we need to make and, and problems, but also real potential solutions. That does not mean that talking about climate change as something that is happening moves you away from what is called mitigation, trying to reduce its impact. But it does mean that you cannot now talk about climate impact as something in the future. If you remember the Al Gore movie, one of the big moments was when he had this graph going, and then he went up on this ladder because the graph went off the, off the thing, mm -hmm. right? And, but there was always this hope, okay, we have time, and we can think about the long term in a particular way. My argument is that that's no longer so, but I'll come to that. And the third thing I want to think a little about, what might our climate look like? In, 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 in terms of injustice in this age of, um, of, um, uh, of, of, of adaptation. So if, if all of that is true, what I want to do is to tell you a story in one metaphor, five pictures, and six injustices uh, waiting to, 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 become, to become worse. Uh, and, and I'm going to start doing that by, and I apologize particularly to that, Larry, in this one. I'm going to be stupid. Uh, not silly. Silly. I hope not silly. Silly. Uh, professors, of course, are allowed to be silly, and deans can also sometimes be, be silly, so allow me, allow me that. Imagine for a moment you are not at the School of Theology at Boston University. Imagine for a moment you are not at Boston University. Uh, imagine you are not in the U.S. Imagine you are not even on this planet. You are on some other planet. Choose your planet. There used to be nine of them, now they say there are eight, and at least one of them is not doing very well. And up there, you are in Becky's class, and she has asked you to look down on this thing called Earth and to write in two pages or less, 12 point times Roman, no footnotes. <laughs> there, I, I've actually used this on an actual assignment for many years. In two pages, a country report on the country called Earth. So imagine this was a country, right? If we take this global thing seriously, I'm not saying sort of world government and that sort of thing. But if it were a country, by the way, we measure countries and label them. Right? The World Bank does this all the time. Write a two-page report on what sort of a country this is. And the reason I do this is if we are in the business of trying to manage planetary processes, policies, as we do in other contexts, then let's at least try to figure out what it is we are talking about. So yeah, there you are looking down, and I'll rush through this. So you, we can spend as much time as you want on the numbers. Do you come immediately to conclusion, country Earth is a poor country, right? by every measure of the term. A billion people living on less than a dollar a day. Two billion people living on less than two and a half dollars a day. Uh, it used to be two dollars a day, but the dollar ain't what it used to be. So you'll say this is a poor country. But you'll say, well, not all of it is poor. While it's a poor country, it's a divided country. And that famous Mehbubul Haq, uh, and again, my apologies for this, this not, but, uh, but anyhow, for, is, is uh, it's a divided planet, right? The champagne glass, you would want it to be much more like the bear mug, but 80% of the world's wealth controlled by less than 20% of its people, and 20% of its people 
uh, 80% of its people sort of uh, marginalized. Now, I'm not talking, I'm not talking rich country, poor country. That's easy. That's slow. I'm talking rich people, poor people. Right? So for nearly 25 years, I've lived here now in Boston, and I've worked here and studied at MIT and so on and so forth, and I, I've worked in what you would call the first world part of Boston. Three miles away from me right there, kind of in the, that direction, you start getting into the third world part of Boston. I moved back to Pakistan, as I mentioned, and I lived in Lahore in this wonderful university, amazingly beautiful campus. Uh, not much was different. Many things were better. So I lived in the first world part of Pakistan. Three miles from where I lived and worked was a place called Bhattar Chowk, the third world part of Pakistan. So I'm talking about that distribution. So you'll say, OK, this is a poor country. It's a divided country. Uh, you'll say it is not just a poor and divided. It is an insecure planet. Insecure in all the terms that we talk about. Certainly useless war uh, happening everywhere. But water insecurity and food insecurity and climate insecurity and all sorts of human insecurity. So you can say it is poor. It is divided. Is it insecure? Uh, it is a degraded planet. Its uh, forests are denuded, its soils are degraded, its climate is changing, its seas are rising. So in all those terms, people go around drinking water and plastics, not realizing that by doing that, each of you, by the way, if you didn't know this, this is the WWF fact, uh, each one of us supposedly is, is consuming the equivalent of a credit card in plastic every week, the equivalent of a plastic hanger every month. Happy digestion. Uh, <laughs> you will come to the conclusion it's not just poor, it's not just divided, it's not just, it's just insecure. It is a poorly governed planet. So by all the measures you and I use all the time in our classes of good governance, apply that to how we govern global systems. Just take whatever you talk about good governance and apply that to how you do any global process. And you will say this is a poorly governed, governed planet. And you would come to the conclusion that it is an unsafe country. I carry a Pakistan passport still, so I know all about travel advisories. By the actual rules used by the US State Department to give travel advisories, the travel advisory would be get on the first rocket ship out of here. You just don't know where to go. I'm sorry to do this early to you on a Saturday. I have another set of slides about all the ways in which the world has become better. That's not the point. The point I'm making is what I've just put together, and you can do this in period, is the picture of what you call and think about third world countries. Right? And I usually don't like that term, but I put that there because if you think of the policy environment in the third world country, massive inequality low governance, huge distrust. That's the global system. We try to make global policy as if we live on planet Sweden. We don't. Right? And that is one of the, 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 the things that, that make, has made climate policy in particular uh, go where, where it has. Now hold that, hold that view in a minute. And, and, and these, these, this is, is new stuff, but I'll, I'll rush through this. Where are we in the climate conversation? So there's something called Paris. I won't go into sort of my view in it, which is, which is I, I don't think it, it, it was that as, as important a milestone in many ways as it was made to be. But we needed something to celebrate at that point. And thank God it happened. So anyhow, without sort of going into that commentary, it was essentially two things. It's essentially two numbers. And one number was this one. And the beauty of a number like this is it's so many zeros that I have no idea what it means. And nor did anyone in Paris. That's 100 billion that was supposed to come from you, me, companies, and so on and so forth. Through these voluntary measures may or may not come. But that was the big number that was thrown. That's the amount that the world will spend on mitigation and adaptation so that the curve will be, uh, will, will, will be bent. And it will be bent for the purpose of these numbers, right? So the big numbers that, that you now hear everywhere, they came out of thin air, by the way, uh, because sort of, you know, they came from lots of conversation, but these could have been different. They came essentially was 2 degrees centigrade and 1.5 degrees centigrade, right? So that the global temperature 
the goal was is we have to maintain below 1.5 and certainly not above 2 in order to remain in the safe zone. Now, simply by doing that, we have already condemned a whole host of the world, including ourselves and maybe California, to things that might happen below 1.5, but let's leave that aside. 1.5 came only because a lot of small countries, Bangladesh and a lot of other small, uh, uh, not other, uh, low-lying places, mostly island states, essentially said, two is too late for us. By the time two happens in Vanuatu, half of me is gone. And therefore, they said, OK, we'll try for 1.5, wink, wink. Everyone kind of knew it won't happen. At this point, the science is pretty, pretty clear. We are still reluctant to say this. But even not in the lines, but even between the lines of the last IPCC report, the, the fact is pretty clear. 1.5 ain't happening. I hope I'm wrong. Most of my life has been spent in hoping I was wrong on the things I've worked on. I hope I'm wrong, but there is just scientifically nearly no way that you're going to make it. And we keep still talking about it as if we have 30 days left or 70 days left. It makes us feel as if, OK, just get up and do something. But try to think about what you would have to do, and it ain't happening. Two might happen. Two might happen. And that means in the justice sense that we have taken, you have taken, a decision that some things are going to go to Warren County, right? So what was his name? Uh, Buck. Buck Watt is me. I met the enemy. What was the Pogo part cartoon? We are not the enemy, and he is us. Yeah, we are Buck. We are Buck. We made that decision because, frankly, for much of us, it won't happen. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, am I making this up? <laughs> Maybe some of it, but not all of it. Here is, here is a visualization of why this is not a future issue. Keep your eye here and look at what happens in the middle of the circle. Those are the years. These are for every month what the world's climate temperature is, starting in the 1850s. This is 1890. This is 1.5. This is 2. You do not make up this stuff. This is ended in 2016. Today, in November 2019, we've had four months in the last two years when the 1.5 has been It could still come in, so you won't sort of proclaim that. What that means, if there is anyone in this room who is 37 years or younger, you know, Larry, myself, and maybe a few others have at least had the pleasure of, of, of seeing a world at least sometimes which was warmer than normal. If you're 37 or younger, you have never in your life seen a year that was cooler than average. Never. On global terms. Right? What does that mean? Sorry to scare you. I, I, this is not something. I don't know why you did this to that one on a Saturday <laughs> morning of all things. You know? Here is what that means. That was for the world. That's not how impacts happen. Impacts happen place by place. Same data. Same data. Right? Look at the years. Same data, but now by place. The justice part of it. Draw a map of the world. Put where the impacts are. And see what you get. Same data, but now, now by place. So this is no longer a global issue, and this is no longer, uh, the, sorry, this is, this is a global issue, and this is no longer a future issue. Right? That's the point, and that's, that's, that's where we are uh, till, till, till last year. So, so the numbers and the science is pretty clear, the distribution is pretty clear, and it's given us some great graphics. Uh, this, by the way, if you haven't seen, you can get a tie in this, you can get socks in this, because that's what's going to save the world. This is beautiful. <laughs> this, no, this is, this is beautiful. You know what this is? This is for every year since 1850. Each of those bars is the world's average temperature. Turns out that ugliness is pretty. Right? It's a very ugly picture in some way. That's your 37 years. But that's, that's what it is. If you see this happening around, this is sort of, you know, one 
really cool way to sort of represent that. But the point is this, this is 1.5. What does 1.5 mean? Right? So you might say, okay, I'm, I live in Boston, you know, between yesterday and today, it moved by 10. We're talking global. We are talking global, and this is what I mean about policy not happening. The latest sort of report on 1.5 essentially says wherever you put your peak, and if you put it at 1.5, the closer you are to it, the more drastic your decline will have to be. Right? If, if you are here, you can choose to sort of gently go down. And we are now at some place where the type of change we are talking about simply logically ain't going to happen. It, it doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter what you do. Because we have now baked it in a way that Buckward has now dumped on Warren country. The question is, where do you take it from there? Uh, I've taken too much. I, I, I won't go through it. What does 0.5 degree change mean? Right? What is the difference between 1.5 and 2? So again, these numbers are meaningless in some ways. Right? You say, OK, half a degree. What's half a degree between friends? I'll tell you what half a degree is between friends. The half a degree between friends is the, the difference is 14% with extreme heat versus 37% of the world get into extreme heat. You'll hear about extreme heat in a minute. Uh, Arctic melt, what, what you would expect once in every 100 years would happen once in every 10 years. Right? That's about what a half degree on the global temperature scale does. Uh, coral reefs, between 70 to 90 percent to 99. Fisheries, a loss, a likely loss of 1.5 million tons to doubling that loss, and so on and so forth. Right? So even, even if we, we, even that half degree, is a lot. And what that means is, this does not mean that you can sort of s stop or reduce the mitigation. Right? I'll, I'll come to this. I hope everyone knows mitigation and adaptation. Those are the only technical terms I'd use. Mitigation essentially is, you have a problem, you say, let me take the steps so that the problem doesn't happen. I'll mitigate it. Right? That's the world we've been living in. That's the world of carbon management. Carbon is the bad guy, not me. Therefore, if I can make policy to reduce carbon, I can hopefully reduce or end climate change. That is why all mitigation policy essentially was carbon management, all carbon management, most carbon management was essentially energy policy. That's why we talk a lot about energy. Adaptation is what you did this morning. Every one of you did that. You chose a sweater, you chose a jacket because you knew it was going to get cold. Adaptation is something happens out there, and you adapt in your behavior to respond to it. It's, humans are very, very good at it. That's why we've survived. That's been the secret sauce of our success uh, over, over the millennia. Right? But once you live in a world of impacts, then you have, have to adapt. And my argument, as I've already mentioned, is that that time is already with us, that we now live in the age of adaptation. And I'm going to tell the story of adaptation in, 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 in five tragedies. But the age of adaptation for you in this context is also the age of injustice. And in some ways, you and I have to have to have to have to have to figure out sort of this personal local action world feels cool, but by personalizing the problem, we also depersonalize it from others. And that's the global local challenge. In some ways, if I think from when I was a graduate student married to now, the big difference is there was much more discussion about climate justice globally in your classes than there are this in my classes today. In some ways, everyone wants to act on you know, turning that one light off. Now I've done my thing. I just tweeted about climate. I went on Friday and, 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 and said my bet. Therefore, the world will be saved. And, and, and that, that if, if, if there is a dangerous message in what I'm saying, that's it. The tragedy in five pictures, again, very, very quickly, uh, and, and then I'll go to what it means. Uh, this, to me, is, is I, I don't know, Larry, if you've seen this before. Uh, the, so there are five failures. The, the, since you can't sort of read here, the first one is the failure of wisdom. And this is an amazing failure of wisdom. Uh, this, to me, is, I think, one of the most powerful graphs in any field I've ever seen. Any field. 
between 1991 and 2012, 13,950 academic peer-reviewed papers. 13,950 papers written on climate change, of which only 24 in any which way, half of them are by Paul, Paul Lindsay, uh, reject the idea of climate being human induced. I do not know of any scientific issue on which the consensus is this strong. Even gravity, I think, has more people <laughs> done it. No, but that is serious. And yet, yet, this is the conflict, uh, the other part. Yet, we continue to talk about it as if it's a debate. Right? If, if there's a journalist, there's this, this sense that you always have to have one from each side to be balanced. No, that is not balance. Some things do not have two sides. They just have one. It's called the right side. At some point, you, the data becomes, that doesn't mean there isn't scientific questions. But on the fundamental question, I, I used to have this wonderful neighbor every time it snored in Boston, you know, and he would see me, he would look at me and say, so where is your global warming now? And I would say, it's coming, don't worry. It's, it's on its way. It's happening. It's coming. So that's the failure of wisdom. Right? What Greta keeps talking about is right. It's, she's not saying you, the tragedy is not that we didn't do the right things. Yes, that's bad. That's not the tragedy. The tragedy is we knew and didn't do the right things. Right? So that's the failure of wisdom. It's a failure of negotiation. I, uh, that's what my work with Larry was, and for years I followed it. I was at every COP, the Conference of the Parties, from the first one in Bonn, to Copenhagen. And then I went cold Turkey until, until Paris. And partly it was that the negotiation exercise became an ex has become an exercise in self-perpetuation. Mm -hmm. The main output of every negotiation is to take out your calendar and say, when is the next meeting? And we see this in lots and lots of things. Wow. But, but there is a self-perpetuating epistemic community that we have trained to talk to each other in the same way for the act of constantly negotiating rather than solving, solving problems. The third of those failures, and the third and fourth I think are particularly important, is a failure of vulnerability. That's the failure of geography. Warren County was Warren County because it was Warren County. Right? The meat does do inherit the world, it turns out. Uh, things are always bad for the vulnerable, are always and everywhere bad for the weak. This, you don't need to read everything, you just need to look at the color. This graph says who's hurt by climate change. This graph says who caused climate change. And they are near opposites. This is not about injustice being created. You did not, when you were emitting carbon, say, I want Bangladesh to be hurt by this molecule and not me. Just like Buck, I don't think he was going to, he, he was doing that saying, I want Warren County to be hurt. And you and I didn't do that either. But the fact is that the vulnerabilities are always going to be with the poor, even within those poor countries. Right? And I'll just come to that in a minute. Because you know, when, 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 the, when, when the hurricane happens and first comes to Haiti, the headlines are 300 people dead. Then it comes to Miami, same force, 300 million lost. That's, you may say it's unfair, it's not injustice at one point. Why, why, why is the impact in one place measured by death and the other by dollars? Because the death doesn't happen here. I don't, we don't, none of us want it to happen there. But why does it happen in Haiti? To take a different example, when earthquakes happen, people don't die because the earth shook. People die because the ceiling fell. Mm -hmm. And the ceiling fell because they didn't have the resources to build. Right? That's the justice question. Justice question is not about uh, fetishization of who is evil. It is the question of how to do good. Right? That's the justice question. So the vulnerability failure, and now you're, you're exactly the map from, from your, that turns into the moral failure. And the moral failure, this diagram, by the way, comes from a company called Standard & Poor. So they looked at the country risk. It's already old. But look at that map and then close your, don't close your eyes, but look at that map and make in your head the map of where the emissions come from. And you see that mismatch, wow. right? And that I mark, have always and, and, and continue to argue is the, climate, the politics, the global politics of climate justice. 
that just like the Warren County people, if I didn't create the mess, why am I having to pay for it? And what was un in the age of mitigation a theoretical question in the age of adaptation becomes a real one. I'll go to rush through this. I've taken too much to, I, I really do apologize, but I'm having so much fun. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and finally, it's a, it's a failure of politics. And failure of politics is not, I mean, this is, you know, it's, this is an easy, easy one to hit at, but it's also unfair because it's not just him. You, you, this could have been about. The failure of politics was not the president. The failure of politics was us. I still would say the single most honest statement ever made by a politician on climate change was George Bush in 1992 at Rio. Anyone remember that statement? The American lifestyle is not open to negotiation. <laughs> and the fact is, he, in, it's, when you say, mm, it's not about him, it's about you, yeah. right? We all want our, we, we are not going to change where we live, we are just going to wait for Tesla. I'm not going to change my, my lifestyle, I'm just going to wait for someone to give me better lithium ion batteries so that I can use the same. We've known this for 30 years too. So that's the failure of politics is not just failure of leadership. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is overall. So, 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 and that brings us to the future shock. What does, what do, what, what does climate injustice look like in the age of adaptation, right? So till now we've been focused on carbon, right? Carbon management and therefore energy management and our use. And again, I highlight this again and again. We will need to continue doing that. The less you do of that, the more you will have to do these things. But the face of climate policy becomes not just carbon management, but other things. And the first of those is, in fact, nature is already biting back and will bite back in, in, in sort of this techno fetishization of climate. And, and I put this for a reason, partly because it's such a nice photograph. But, uh, but usually when you think of nature and climate, what's the photograph that you've seen a thousand times that comes to your mind? The polar bear on the ice, 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 ice bear. I think it's the exact, I keep telling my WWF colleagues, it's the exact wrong picture. That is not what polar bears do. It makes you think there's a polar bear in the middle of the Arctic waiting for the helicopter you know, from FEMA to come and save it. That is not what polar polar bears are not waiting for humans to come and save them. I've talked to a few. <laughs> uh, if you were a polar bear, uh, is humans what you would look towards to do the right thing? Is, you know, is there anything in our track record that gives you hope as a polar bear? These guys will come to their senses now. That's not what nature does. What nature does is it gets into trouble and it hits back. That's a natural reaction. And therefore, the face of climate and nature is not the polar bear. The face of climate and nature is the mosquito, right? And particularly with these white spots. If you ever see the mosquito white, white spots, run as far as you can. A, because the mosquito is smarter than man. This is the dengue mosquito, right? So one of the things that you're seeing that my colleagues here at the public health and other places are doing is the dengue is moving northwards where it shouldn't be, both in the Mediterranean and in South Asia. Now, there are multiple reasons, and maybe one of the major ones is people travel more, they take things with their shoes, and so on and so forth. But the other thing that is clearly happening is the mosquito is finding it to be more and more comfortable in places where it wasn't supposed to be comfortable in. So vector bone disease, right? and there's a reason why I start with this, uh, is, is, is one of those, not just likely, but now, um, you know, again, in our public health, Nahid Bedelia and others are working on, you know, why was the last Ebola crisis that far away from where you would have expected it to be? It was the wrong coast of Africa. And again, that doesn't mean it was only because of climate change. The ecosystem changes, a lot of things changes. It is not just we who are adapting. It is other species that are adapting, and then they work as they do. If, if, if mitigation was management of carbon, then a lot of adaptation is going to be management of water. Water is to climate adaptation was what carbon was to mitigation. So think about it this way. Most of the impacts of climate are wet. What happens when the climate changes? Water rises, sea level rise. Water melts, glaciers. Water disappears, drought. Water falls from the sky like no one's business, extreme events. 
So the, so the cutting edge issue on climate impacts for most part is water. And I would say that what we will be training and working with at least in the next half century, when people say they work on climate, they are less, they're not, like, they're not only likely to be saying they're working on energy, they would likely to be saying they're working on something about water. That's, that's where the thing is. To give you a sense what that means, uh, this is to scale. This is to scale. If that's the earth, that's all the fresh water in the world. Now, th don't take the wrong conclusion of that. That's plenty of fresh water. That's plenty of fresh water. The problem is where it is, when it is, who gets it. That's the conflict question. Right? That's, that's, that's the co conflict, conflict question. Uh, to give you an idea of what water means, so Pakistan is a country of 200 million. Um, here's what's happening. Pakistan is now in the ninth consecutive years of large floods, in the seventh consecutive year of a major drought, and in the sixth consecutive years of a massive heat wave. By massive heat wave, you mean 200, 200, 300 people die a week at the, at the peak of it. Wow. At the same time. Wow. In the same country. And it's not the only one, right? Next door, India is, is bigger. Go a little further on Bangladesh is slightly different. But it's, so that's what climate does. Climate doesn't bring new calamity that you can say is because of climate. It takes existing stresses. And two things happen. The amplitude changes and the frequency changes. Two, of, two things happen. You get each one to be more dangerous or more frequent, right? So when the 2010 flood happened, we were trying to raise, a lot of us are Pakistani Americans were trying to raise support and, and money for it and we realized I realized that sort of you know people weren't getting what a flood means in a country like Pakistan. So this is the country of Pakistan. This blue area, look at the squiggly and remember the squiggly, right? Is what the flood covered area was in pictures with the dark blues would be pictures like this. That's a village, right? So I took this and I took that squiggly uh, I took that squiggly and put it on the map of the US. To proportion to, uh, to scale that would cover from Vermont down to Florida you put it on a map of Japan you don't see the Japan you put it on a map of Europe it's from Denmark to France right? and, and again you do this with India and we're talking continental scales and if you look at the heat heat uh, heat numbers in in Delhi for the last four years right 300 people die doesn't make the, not even the front page it doesn't make the news uh, there's a, uh, I'll come to the heat, heat in a minute. So, so that becomes the front edge of in the age of adaptation. Right? Now, by the way, there's a lot of opportunity here because I'll, I'll come to that. I won't spend time on this. And again, I'm sorry this is getting cut off. If you're talking about water, you're immediately talking food. Right? Because what is food except nature's way of packaging water? <laughs> so that it can be transported. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I know it's a bit facetious, but not entirely wrong. Right? And, and, and then you're talking food security, and then you're talking again the multiple injustices. It, it, each of these gets added. Mobility, which is one of the favorite things, right? I would love a Tesla if I could afford it. Uh, but but, but this, is, this is actually in some ways the thing we won. I think that transition has happened. There's this amazing technology out there. But you start talking about the places I'm talking about, mobility is not a question of emissions. Or it's not just a question of emissions, it's a question of numbers, how many people. Mobility is not what, what, what I'm going to emit coming this morning here. It is about how do you move people in these numbers. Wow. And you start multiplying by those numbers, even if you reduce your car to one-tenth of the emission, it doesn't solve. Now you're back to city planning. Now you're back to thinking how you build communities. You know, confession here since I am at the School of Theology. Confession time. I, I drove down here on a Prius. I'm a good guy. Except I drove down 28 miles. Would you rather I drive 28 miles every morning and every evening in a Prius? Or I get a gas guzzler and live as Larry now, now lives downtown a mile away. Right? Those are the challenges. Of, of, of the future, and, and that's what mobility brings. I'm, I'm taking too long, but I, I, I want to just sort of wrap up. Uh, won't even go into this. Infrastructure, again, becomes a different question, right? Infrastructure becomes not just a question of the greenest building with the highest lead rating, as we will have in our new building at BU. It says, how do you take a planet of seven and a half billion soon to be eight? 
and provide decent communities, right? That's the justice question. Uh, because sort of, again, these, these are going to have costs. And, 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 and much like the state of North Carolina, someone will have to decide to go for the lead building or a non-lead building that gives more people more. more. That's, that's heat. I, I'm going to just take a minute. Heat is the one that I think in this country, because we don't get it, luckily, we, we don't understand what heat means. Heat is not the same as drought. Right? So there's a place in Pakistan called Turbat. Turbat uh, is, uh, is the fifth highest recorded now um, temperature anywhere in the world and the highest for a reasonable size populated city. In the last seven years, it has broken its own record four times. Wow. 128 degrees. Mm -hmm. right? So Death Valley gets more. But because it does, there's no one there. Now, Turbat, we are talking about just under a million people. Wow. That heat is different. And heat is not even about the temperature. It's about, it's about the extent. So Karachi, this is a city of 10 million. This is a city of over 10 million. These are cities of 4 to 5 million. Right? That's, that's the city heat index. So we have these concrete enclaves, coffins, that deal with heat in a different way. It's not a question of what the temperature is. When you have it in highly populated, dense cities, the impacts are actually lethal, are actually lethal. Um, you know, 300 people dying in a week, uh, 200 people dying in a week uh, becomes the norm. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is not a siesta. This is not a siesta. Any place that has a shade, the city starts looking different. Uh, dealing with bodies, dealing dealing with bodies becomes, and this is now in South Asia at least four or five years across the board, wow. right? And so again, the injustice is not happening because of climate change. It's happening because poverty was already there, bad health systems were already there, very dense, badly planned cities were already there, and on top of that, you get climate change. So it becomes the exacerbating force. Those were uh, those were bodies, for example, which had to be buried in these large communal graves because you couldn't even sort of in, at, at, at the peak of the worst of the crisis. Uh, just the, it wasn't just able to figure out who was who. Yeah. Right? So because again, it, it, it affects the, the poorest. And, and there's some condition already. So the point I'm making is that there are all, all of these things uh, that are happening. And this becomes the front edge of climate, climate action. Now, there is a good, good news in the sense that this is an opportunity to solve a lot of other problems that we have to be, have been concerned about. I wanted to spend a minute on refugees. I'm sorry, this is what cut here. It says refugees. Climate and migration is something that, that a colleague of mine, Hendrik Salil, and I have been working on and, and is a major, major concern. When we think of refugees, we think of this. Right? Something bad happens somewhere, and a lot of people immediately move to Turkey or Germany, and, and, and then we have to deal with it. Uh, climate refugees, is, it doesn't happen like that. It happens much more like economic migration. Things that we've seen in this country, for example, in the Dust Bowl, things that we saw across many developing countries, for example, with the Green Revolution. That essential motor is your livelihood goes away. And when the livelihood goes away, the strongest, the youngest, the smartest move out in search of other opportunities. The weakest, the most marginalized, the most vulnerable hollow out and remain. Right? So we've seen that, that multiple times. And Paul Collier says that leads to conflict. He says the Rwandan war was the first, maybe, of the major climate wars, uh, climate-induced wars. But the best example I can give you is what's happening in the Sundarbans in Bangladesh right now. So Sundarbans are these mangrove forests on the coast, very heavily populated place. Micro-millimeter changes, <laughs> micro-millimeter changes in sea level between fresh and salt water. The shrimp that lives at that edge, the major export, moves where the salt and fresh meat. When that changes, the shrimp move outside of what the poor shrimp cultivators can get to in their boats. Livelihood gets lost. We are seeing this. The numbers are already there. Salim Al-Haq and others have worked on People start moving because their livelihood is gone. They move to Dhaka. From Dhaka, they move to Bombay. They'll eventually end up right here at, at Boston, at the mall. Right? That's the nature of, of, of climate refugees. I'll give you this example. This is from an old paper. In, uh, oh, no, this is a problem. Um, because there's a date here that you can't see. Now, so there's a date here. And I think it is January 
1976. This is a place called Parrot Beaks. This is the Parrot's Beak. Uh, and keep your eye here. This is Sierra Leone, this is Guinea, this is Sierra Leone. Keep your eye here. This is January 76. I'm going to fast forward that picture from 76 to I think 91 or something like that. Uh, I'm sorry, the date was down there. Look what happens here. What do you think happened? Forest. Yes, but what? What happened? War. War. Where do you think the war happened? The war happened here in Guinea. War happens, I'm smart, I, <laughs> I run the other way. Right? Where do I run? I run here. When I run here, the pressure on this forest doubles. That's what refugees do, right? So the concept of refugee does, right? It puts pressure on that to Paul Collier argument. It puts pressure on resources. And again, I'm sorry the date 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 wouldn't, but that would. So anyhow, I I I've I've I've, I've gone too long. I let, let me use this last slide and then I do promise to shut up. The, the argument is not security, the argument is insecurity. Right, so this is from a book I did in 2006 on climate, uh, environment, human development, and security. And the, the argument is, is not people get, people, it gets important when people become insecure. When was the last time that we in the US felt, s really started taking security seriously? 9-11. 9-11, right? Or after that, the financial crisis. When, when insecurity hits you is when you take security seriously. Otherwise, people don't. So in, in the book, we, I did sort of this, this, this and, and this is a good thing to end this conflict part and hand over to better people than myself. Uh, you know, where does insecurity come from? And so I had this very simple sort of social science model that there are at least two major axes. One is the nature of, call it conflict, but in this case, violence. What is it that physically makes you are insecure. And that can range from someone hits me, violence, to someone doesn't hit me, but makes me insecure in some other way. Jobs get lost. Right? Um, social services don't work. And the other is from state to society. Here is, here is the heuristic I want to put in, and I do promise to say that. The very simple model was, when you have state-level violence, it's clearly insecurity, and clearly the source of insecurity with state level violence is war, right? We can all understand war as insecurity. No problem, all of the literature talks about it. When it is violence, people hitting each other, but at the society level, insecurity comes from civil strife, right? And we've seen at least for 20 years more people, many more people dying in civil strife, violent, than, than in war. Here is, I think, where it becomes more interesting. When it is, it is social disruption, but at the state level. The insecurity comes from institutional failure. Right? I saw load shedding here, not having electricity. But we've also actually seen that here in the US the last time with the financial crisis. Suddenly everyone is feeling insecure, not because there's a war happening in New York, but because my home is no longer safe. Uh, my mortgage isn't safe. And finally, when you have Social disruption at a societal level, insecurity comes from human security, insecurity, right? the type of things I'm talking about. Here is, here is from this book, we did a back of the envelope calculation. And this is not a political statement. Uh, this was about South Asia. At that point, India and Pakistan had an ongoing, unending conflict for 60 years. 60 years of unending conflict. I've given this number to very senior people in both countries. They always nod and do nothing. But 60 years of constant war between India and Pakistan. Total number of Indians killed by the Pakistan side in 60 years of constant conflict is less than the number of children only who die in one year only because of dirty water only in the city of New Delhi only. The same, exact same number is true on the Pakistan side in Karachi. Mm -hmm. If you're the mother of that child who just died because of dirty water, your child is no less dead than if she had died at the wrong end of a gun. Mm -hmm. And yet, 
we treat these very differently. Right? Dying at the wrong end of a gun, dying at the wrong end of a tap. As, as citizens, as journalists, as scholars, as policy people, as politicians. One is a national calamity, the other is a development statistic. Now here's my problem as a policy person. 25 years teaching international relations, I have no idea what to do about the wrong end of the gun. At the time of writing that, the cost of saving one life because of dirty water was $8.36. That's the choice. That's, wow. that's the choice. So that, I, again, I have real deep apologies for taking too long, but thank you for getting me out of it in this trivia. And, <laughs> and, and back, back here. Uh, I've given a very bleak picture, but in that picture is a lot of opportunity for win-wins. In a sense that unlike mitigation policy, which was mostly about how you have to pay something to reduce a problem, solving any of these problems has huge collateral benefits. And that, I think, is where the opportunity is. Thank you so much. You have not taken too long. And so we would actually like to invite questions for, uh, if you all have questions for Dean Najam. Questions? So I had I, I spoke similar not the same presentation but similar point to my class the other day, and I got so much pushback exactly on that point. They liked all the other cute pictures, except for that one because that was kind of saying it's partly your fault, right? And that's not that's not comfortable to take. My 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 grandmother was a very wise person. Uh, empirical data suggests all grandmothers are wise. <laughs> Grandfathers we don't know about. Uh, she used to say, you point one finger at someone, at least three point back at you, right? So this is not to say there isn't the institution, particularly in energy, right? So do I have agency to change the grid? Not really. Do I have agency to change the system? No, not really. But I do have the agency as a political actor to push for certain things. And the empirical evidence of the 30 years is we haven't, right? The empirical evidence, again, is that that, that we haven't changed our own lifestyles even in the ways that we knew. There's a colleague, I, I'm just waiting for this research, um, she's, I think at, she's at New York uh, University, uh, that who I heard recently, and I, I want to sort of see her stuff to, to be sure of this, who finds out that according to her, young people today are more informed and concerned about the climate than any 10-year any gaps uh, since the issue came up. Right? Way off the chart. Way off the chart. So that part of education went. And yet in this country, they are consuming more than young people of those age groups have ever done. You can blame it on Amazon Prime, but it's or H and M or Forever 21, but it's not just that. So yes, you are right. Yes, you are right. But to me, responsibility does begin with the letter I. And, and, and I do think that activism without action ain't enough, right? So I know where my generation failed. And now the question is what, what, what that does because we didn't do our stuff. So I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm getting into treacherous territory, so be kind to me, please. Mm -hmm. I am a guest, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, ma'am. So, so I have a question. Um, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but in terms of like the I, taking responsibility, I was thinking about this, I recently left California with fires and all this kind of stuff, and so um, on a, sorry. So in San Jose, there was um, this initiative to sort of build tiny houses to, to help the, the homeless population, right? And it was overwhelmingly denied, right, by well-intentioned, well liberal people who did not think that San
saying no to this was problematic, right? And the argument for it was, if it was an entire, it was it, it was a, a community of people who couldn't see that as nimbyism as as problematic, because it was a kind of um, we worked really hard, and it isn't that we don't want people to have housing, it's that. Um, the people were talking about housing near our children. So it became like this safety issue, right? Like it, it became like, a, oh, well, homeless people are more likely to use drugs, are more likely to um, have violent behavior. The, the, the way in which it would impact my quality of life is bad. So I'm, I'm not voting against people being in homes. I'm voting against people impact, you know, um, impacting the quality of my life. And that is, a, I think, in many ways, I, I wanted to say, like, this is a legitimate argument. And at the same time, I felt I was living in a, 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 a community of faith where I was like, on some level, we have to get this back to, like, we're talking about people being able to live inside, right? Like, and, and recognizing the power that we have as, as a community to say, like, oh, yes, this might be a legitimate question, like we, yeah, I want my kids to, to live in, in a safe community that's clean, but we've somehow created a picture of people that is self is incorrect and that itself is preventing us from being like, literally we're talking about people being inside versus outside. I like think how, do you, how does this help? I, I think that's what you've said, just take that and instead of saying San Jose and class, she used countries, and you've just described everything I've said, and I didn't want to be unfair on the previous question to link the two again. It's not to say that a lot has to be done by institutions and governments, but I do think that we as individuals, me, have also made choices in what to push our institutions on. Right, so I'll give you another uncomfortable example. And uh, BU or Boston, right? So I and other colleagues at Earthquake Environment are very much working with the more of my other colleagues with the city to meet its goals, right? And this is one of the good things happening that cities will meet goals. But now look at the world, and it's kind of like your San Jose thing, right? I'll, I, I'm going to be responsible for where I am. Yeah. And if I'm BU, I'm going to make my buildings the best one. Now, if it is truly a global issue, that's why I started with that global part then you should also be asking sort of, you know, okay, so what are those relative investments in different places on climate? Yeah. And especially if there's a justice argument to who causes the problem. The fear, the danger is what you're talking about, the fortress mentality. I will make my fortress and I, my fortress will be okay. So you can very, you know, remember the map of the world which moved? Mm -hmm. And it is going to affect different places differently. And climate change, at some level is going to affect everyone, but it's going to have affect different people differently. And, and the challenge of the delay has been that the more, the more it happens, the more my impulse is going to be to make my fortress safe first. Mm. Right? So the logic of international action weakens with every passing day because the logic of individual action changes. Right? And I don't know the answer to this. I, because here's the thing, we, you know, the first slide could be reversed. We live in an amazing time. There's more food than, that, than we need to feed everyone, that people are hungry. There's more knowledge. There's more resources. I have no doubt that we have the ideas, the resources, the information to do, to lick the problem. None at all. Right? I think the energy transition is happening. Transport, there are amazing things happening. Amazing things happening in, bus in uh, building technology. What I don't know is whether we have the wisdom to do it at a species level. And that's the problem in, in San Jose. Mm -hmm. And that's also because the logic works. Yeah. The, the logic of those who say don't build it is the same logic. I'm going to make my university, my city safe first. And Bangladesh, good luck. Right? I and mean, I don't know the answers to this. I'm just saying sort of that's, that's, the, that's what this guy is thinking about. I'm just saying that I really love this idea of adaptation. Um, and, it, and it makes me think a little bit of, we're really focused on mitigation, like we can solve the problem. And I wonder whether some of this um, 
power of positive thinking plays in a little bit to the to the resistance to adaptation in that you know well we can make our own buildings LED and I could put solar panels on that's sort of like or in San Francisco make earthquake safe buildings when you build them if you go wholesale into Haiti into Bangladesh and you're like we are gonna like really work on infrastructure here because when the earthquakes hit, when the water rises, these guys are gonna get hit by it and we wanna make sure that they're safe when it happens. And when we say it's gonna happen, that's kind of an admission of defeat, which in this sort of weird power of positive thinking thing that we've developed in this Western world is, is like predicting the future and it's gonna make the future come true, which is obviously bullshit, but I'm just wondering how it plays in. It, it does. I, mean, I think that's that's the challenge. It, it's compounded by another thing, and because I, I do want to be honest on, on this one. Note the pictures I showed of poor people and so on and so forth. It's just like we are not a monolith. No other country is. Mm. So each of these decisions, when they're happening in Bangladesh, are also contested decisions right. in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not simply US versus this or Europe versus that. Within Bangladesh, there is people like me. Right, the elites, and sort of, if I if I get some adaptation resources, mm -hmm. then my choice is: do I spend it on these totally marginalized shrimp farmers in the Sundarbans, mm -hmm. or do I take Bangladesh and uh, the Dhaka and give it the shiny um, metro system? Mm -hmm. Right, both things are good, but that's a choice. Mm -hmm. Right, and so the environmental justice choice is at every level. My my hard to leave with you if there is any is that it happens at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. I do not know the answers, but you have to recognize those multiple levels and your actually that's why it's a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Has 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 to be there. And the longer the delay happens, the less likely it is that the justice approach will be taken. Right? Mm -hmm. So the the tragedy of having waited is that you know when things weren't this dire, you and I could rationally think of the other more than we would now. I don't know if we have time, but um, there's one more. One more. Uh, last, two, last question. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, thinking of uh, adaptation and adaptation. If we look at uh, other things, then it means evolution for some mm -hmm. species that are made that same framework, and then it means that some are going to disappear, and that's a fact. So I guess that's what that, well, yeah. we don't want to say. That but we, it's going to happen. We make that choice every time we do something. Mm -hmm. So my, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you. No, 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 so that, I just wanted to know, is, is that pretty much like, we're not saying it, but is that's the point, no, that it's going to happen, and uh, it's happening. And, and that's the choice. That's the choice that societies have made historically. That's the choice we're making. I, this is not a, I hope I'm not bad mouthing a company because I, I think there are good things happening out of it. I, I just three weeks ago uh, canceled our, our Amazon Prime. And part of the reason is I live in a town uh, close to where you used to live where we have to take our, gar we don't have um, garbage collection service. So you, every weekend you put it in your car and you take it to the station. It's a very, very good system. It's, it's a nice place. But that means you actually get to see what you're producing. <laughs> and for week after week, the number of these empty boxes was just going up. Right? And so again, I, I hope I'm not bad mouthing Amazon or whatever. It's sort of this realization that we ourselves sort of trap ourselves into behaviors that become very easy. It's sort of Richard Taylor's nudge that we as a society have been nudging ourselves into certain types of behavior. We do this with all sorts of things. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll end with this. I was telling my students when I, when I was really young, um, the first ice cream company in Pakistan, we used to have ice cream, but you know, packaged ice cream that you could get from a freezer, it's called pol polka. And there were these little cups that it would come in and the great treat, you know, once a month or whatever, my grandmother would take us to this place and get us these little, you know, paper uh, cups of polka ice cream. Uh, but here is the interesting thing: the deal was we get the ice cream, but we have to eat it carefully and not mess the cup, which we then have to give back to grandmother, 
who would rinse it and use it, right? And uh, I think lots of people now that sounds like a silly thing, but here is the thing: if you try to do that today, you will become a hoarder, right? That worked because there was that few of it. You start, try to do that with yogurt cups, and before you know it, you will be the world supplier of yogurt cups because everything comes in things like that. But that's the type of decisions when I say, you know, the agency question, that I think irrespective of what institutions have done as individuals, we have failed. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. for a 10 minute break and then we'll be coming back at 11 to hear from Dr. Lauren Suskind. So I have the pleasure of introducing our next presenter, Dr. Larry Suskind. And there's so much to say about his life work, but he asked me to be brief. So I will acknowledge that he is an MIT professor in urban and environmental planning, and next year he will have been there 50 years. Yes. He started the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School, which included MIT, Harvard, Tufts, and this interdisciplinary work doesn't often happen between the universities, so that was very um, helpful in modeling how we work together. And he also started a nonprofit called the Consensus Building Institute. And he has authored or co-authored over 20 books. He's a leader in this field. And we're very pleased to have you, Larry. Thank you. Thanks very much. I said that uh, I feel I found this talk very depressing. Uh, I love listening to him and we know each other a long time. Um, I'm going to come at things in this from a very different perspective. Um, and actually, I was very excited to get the invitation. I have a problem, and you're the perfect, perfect audience to give me some ideas uh, relative to how to handle this problem. Um, so I work as a mediator in very complex disputes, many of them concerning um, water and other kinds of natural resources, uh, different parts of the world, but also different parts of the United States. So imagine you have my kind of a problem. You have a group of people around the table in the city, in the United States, and um, each person is there because they represent, either officially or informally, a different segment of the population in this city. The city water department has been shutting off water to households. In most parts of the Northeast, for example, you can't shut somebody's electricity off in the winter. They'll die. And there are laws that say you can't do that. And even if they don't pay their bills, you can't just shut off their electricity. Uh, but you can shut off their water if you're a water department. And the first thing that happens when the water shut off is they notify the human services agency, which come and take the children away, because it's an unsafe environment. No water, no toilets, no sewer. There's a recent report that came out, looked at 177 cities in the United States. There's a lot of places where 5, 10, 15 percent of households in a year are getting their water shut off. And of course, it's no surprise which households haven't been able to pay their bills. The poorest segment of the community. If you miss two or three bills in a row, and you owe seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, it starts to accumulate interest. 
And after a period of time, in Massachusetts, for example, the city holds an auction. And there's a bunch of companies that will show up and buy those debts. We used to see in the movie, right? The mob buys somebody's gambling debt, and then every week they charge you more than the total debt in interest, and the, they can't get out from under it. Well, what happens is the city sells this lien on the property, this debt, and then the person comes after them like a bill collector and says, if you don't pay this debt, eventually we're going to sell your house. Hundreds and hundreds of people in some cities, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Detroit, water shut off. And so you could imagine one of these cities, people in the community are, are scared and outraged. These are people they know. They have their water cut off. Children are put in foster care. There's no way they can fix it. They don't have work. Whatever the issues were about losing their job, they don't have work. They can't pay the bill, and the bill is getting higher, and then there's a lien against their property, and they sold that lien, and there's the prospect of the house being sold, and they won't get the money from the sale of the house. The person who holds the lien will get the money from the sale of the house, or the city will get the money from the sale of the house. Why are cities doing this? Cost of providing water and sewer services in many cities goes up every year. Not unusual to go up 5%, 7%, even 10% in Philadelphia, for example. The cost is going up, a cost. These are old systems. They're broken. They leak. It costs a lot to fix them up. People administer the program. They even administer the shutoff program. They got to hire people. And then they say, we got to raise your rates because we have these new costs of having to support an expanded staff because we have to shut off people who aren't paying their bills. So imagine we're sitting around this table, and some of the groups in some parts of the country are faith-based groups who have taken this issue very seriously and are mobilizing to try to protect and help the people who are at risk of or who already have had their water shut off. And the conversation that's going on at this table really has to fo focuses on three things. Should the city be able to shut off people's water? You know, if in some parts of the world, India for example, the constitution of the country says water is a human right. There are people in the United States who, without any special background education, if you said, do people have a right to water? Well, they can't live without it, so yeah, it, it, it's a right. Well then, how can we have cities shutting off people's water? It's not like you can call up a different number and say, turn on water, I'll buy it from a different provider. It's not like TV services. There's one utility. Should the city be able to shut off somebody's water and sewer services? Second question. If people don't pay, whatever the reason, if people don't pay, should the city be able to put a lien against their property and ultimately foreclose on their property when the bill isn't paid after a year or whatever date you want to say? the amount plus the interest. Should people lose their home? 
If they're a renter, should be thrown out of their unit. Well, the city says, hey, if everybody stopped paying, we have no system. You can't let people not pay. It's not fair. Everybody else's rates are going to go up because the costs are the costs of running the system. The costs are going to go up. Everybody's water rates are going to go up. You can't let off the people who, who choose not to pay, whatever their reasons are. And you have plenty of city water departments where the administration of the department has been told, it's your job, run the department. Do what you have to do. We don't have any other money to give you. You have to get the money from rates, from water rates. If you have to raise them, you have to raise them. That's your problem. But we'd like you to run the water department as efficiently as possible. And certainly you can't let people just not pay. And so, water departments, utilities believe it's their responsibility to all the users of the system to go after the people who aren't paying their bills, or everybody else's rates go up. There's no other money to bring into the system except rates. And the third question that comes up is, well, you know, not just individuals pay rates, but corporations, industries pay rates. Charge them more, or even charge wealthier people more. Why do we have a system of rates that's not progressive, when in the same city we can have a property tax system or a other kind of tax system that is progressive, that wealthy people pay more? Why should everybody pay the same amount for the water they use when they have, one has a lot of money and one has almost no money. Why don't we have a progressive system of rates? Wouldn't that be fairer? Those three questions. Shut off. Debt. Progressive rates. So, we brought together in many communities people representing all the different kinds of stakeholders. It's not just a come on down, open meeting, here's 500 people in a town hall. It's a structured, facilitated conversation where we have made sure that 10, 15 different categories of interested parties in this story are all represented by people that they chose. It's too long. Um, I'm 100% sure the person in the farthest back will be able to hear me, no matter yeah. how low the turn is. I can't hear you. Let okay. me try this. I turned it down. Okay. So the question is, is it possible to bring people together who represent all the relevant stakeholder groups? where those representatives are chosen by those groups, not by a sponsor of an evening meeting, not by City Hall, and try to come up with an agreement on how the city as a whole should proceed given these questions. This means the agencies at the table, their stakeholder, both management and staff of the agency, it means that the community groups that are advocating for folks who are disadvantaged in this context are at the table. It means that the development community means industry is at the table. It means university people in that city who study these questions are at the table, the kind of source of knowledge that uh, Adol was talking about as a, as a stakeholder. I've got all the stakeholder groups there. I know how to solve that problem. You have an independent neutral spend a substantial amount of time interviewing people privately and confidentially, trying to map the categories of stakeholders and hearing from the stakeholders who they think would represent them. And even hard to represent groups. Let's have future generations at the table. We do that. We have proxies for those interests organizations that say, we'll take that role, we'll take that responsibility. So I solved the representation problem. 
we were having a discussion before things started this morning, and representation is an issue if you're trying to get an informed consensus in a community. Again, I'm not talking about a town hall meeting where people are waving signs. They have those in the city. This is an effort to engage the relevant stakeholders with whatever support those groups think they need with neutral facilitation by a professional mediation team trying to generate an informed agreement about these three things for that city, not in general. I'm talking about implementation of maybe new policy, maybe not. City governments at the table, city councils represented, sitting around in the conversation. Here's my problem. I want your advice on it. Somebody says, here's what we should do about each of those questions. And their reason is that it's, it's in scripture. It's God told me this. Now, I'm trying to facilitate this conversation. I'm trying to get an informed agreement. I am encouraging people to give reasons, not just state positions, but give reasons behind their positions, give their interests. Why? Give explanation, give justification. Why? Because I'm trying to build an agreement and I need to get some group that has a different view on a question to join in some reframing of the issue with a set of reasons behind it so that each person there can go back and explain to their constituency, since they're there as a representative, why that outcome's a good outcome and why it meets their group's interests. And if they try to go home and say, well, we were trying to reach agreement and we decided that you really have to guarantee people water as a right because God says so. And if they happen to be from a group that doesn't share those beliefs or those values, they're going to have a tough time saying to their people why they should agree to whatever the formulation is that we're trying to come to that would represent enough of a consensus with reasons behind it that the city government and the water utility would feel it could perhaps shift the policy. We're, we're not, we don't have policy making power. What we do in public dispute resolution is we try to generate good ideas in a credible way that offer those with responsibility opportunities to make decisions knowing that everyone will agree if they make that decision. So I'm not saying we have a power to make decision. That's why reasons matter. They all have to go back and sell this proposed agreement to somebody some constituency, some back table. What should I do as a mediator when people offer only a faith-based justification for the stand they take on these kind of questions? I very much genuinely want to hear your thinking about that now. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll jump in. When, my, when I was growing up, I remember very clearly my mother many times saying, because I said so. And I hated it so much. I loved my mother dearly, but I hated this so much that I vowed at that point that if I ever had children, never, not one time ever would I say, because I said so. Is it true? Mm -hmm. Our daughter happened this to be my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. I, can admit I have actual proof. <laughs> That just, yeah, lip service. And um, it was really, really, really hard. There were so many times, and I was so tempted as a parent, because we were in a hurry or whatever, whatever, and I just really wanted to say, because I said so. And I forced myself, especially in those moments, 
to come up with actual reasons for why I was asking my children to do the thing or not to do the thing. And I think that we have an internalized authoritarian concept of parenting. The same way we have an internalized authoritarian concept of teaching and of religion and of a lot of things. And this one thing that I refused to do helped to dismantle part of that internalized authoritarianism. And so if I were in your position, I would just simply say, while I respect all of the diversity at this table, I need you, this, not everybody's coming from the same places and the same sources of authority. Can you try to explain why your God tells you that? And okay. if you can't- So that, that, that's the specific um, strategy you are suggesting, if, which is ask people can't, can't, to can't, question- If you can't, have an interfaith conversation. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to imagine, as you're saying that, what, what it was going to feel like when I'm saying back to someone in the room, uh, look, this is a collective decision, not an individual decision, which is a whole other theme apropos of Adel's talk, which is I'm only involved in facilitating collective decisions. So I, I don't work to try to get <laughs> individuals to do things. I assist collectives of people at different scales, including global, to do things. And I try to say to them, they're not asking me for instruction, they're asking me for facilitation and assistance, but I try to say to them, you're much more likely to be able to convince this person over here if you give some reasons that are especially responsive to what they said were their reasons. So the notion of, of eliminating an authoritarian tone leads to, if I'm just replaying what I heard you say, because if I want to use it, I have to understand it. You're saying, ask people to dig deeper to explain to others why they think their God says that, says they should. In other words, get God's reasons when I can't get the person's reasons. Yeah, let me engage with their frame. Yeah. Not dismiss it. No, I, 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 I'm, I'm way past not dismissing it. <laughs> I'm actually looking for the prescriptive moves I would make. And of course, by extension, I'm imagining you might be one of these people, either as a party, representing a party, or in my role, since you're in a conflict transformation program, you know, you might well turn into a mediator in one of these contexts. So it's very important if we encounter this kind of justification that we have a strategy. Yes? Have you tried stipulating rules of conversation in advance? Yes. And um, it's, very, uh, it's a very important point. We would never start such a discussion face to face if we hadn't, in advance of that, um, been in conversation with all of the people we could find one-on-one -on -one privately, not for attribution, to get a sense of who the stakeholders are and to try out on people some proposed ground rules. But the way that ground rules tend to be written, there are things like no ad hominem attacks. Mm -hmm. Can you disagree without being disagreeable? Wait until it's your turn to talk try to limit the length of time that you talk so others have a chance as well. The facilitator will indicate to you when you're running past a fair share of their time. Try to give reasons for the views that you take. That's the extent of the statement in the ground rules relative to what I'm saying. But yes, we do want ground rules. I had an interesting conversation with someone um, actually last week about this very thing. And he said that he w he's an evangelical. And he's like, I felt really challenged. I was in a room. And there was a way in which like the human question was apparent to me. Like, I was talking, like, there's sort of um, an interfaith dialogue that was happening that was really contentious. And it was like, on one level, it was like, we had this agreement about the, the very human impact. But what we realize is that it was our attachment to our, um, what our faith tells us we're supposed to do in the world that was sticking. He's like, I'm an evangelical, and so it's actually my job to convince you to come over to my side. 
right? Like, and I, I'm not, I, hope, I don't mean to offend evangelicals, but he was, he was saying that there was a way in which how he understood his faith was, I'm supposed to go out and actually share the gospel in the way that ultimately is asking me to ask someone else to change their thoughts. And he said, and to how convert. I, yeah, um, and maybe that's a little strict. And he said, and really, how I, I came to being willing to challenge myself was not the question of what does my God say I should do about this and give reasons for it. It was how does my faith ask me to be willing to be challenged, right? And so it was sort of like how does my faith actually approach conflict? How does my faith say I should, okay, God tells me that we should have water for everybody, and so this is a human right. Now the question isn't, is God telling me that that's a human right? It's is how does God ask me to engage with other people who think differently? Right? And what's a possible answer to that? Um, and so mostly he was he was like, I, I don't know, I'm not a Christian. So um, so so what what we came to was then starting to have a conversation, just literally like, as a, as a Buddhist, this is how my faith talks to me about how to talk to you in discord, and so, oh, okay, as an evangelical, this is how my faith is saying I should talk to you about this, and so like, we, there was like a diffusion of... Um, right, but your, your description is of a meta-level conversation. I would we'd be in the middle of the discussion, should the agency be able to shut people's water off, yeah. and I would need to put that discussion aside and ask people, how shall we go forward with that answering that question, given all of our different ways that we feel is are appropriate mm -hmm. to deal with people who have differences on fundamental questions with us? And what I'm saying was, he literally was like, "That's the way to get me to engage in that conversation." Like right. it, it might, like it might be uncomfortable, it might be time-consuming, it might not be great, but that's. But it's not clear to me what the end point is that gets us back to the question. Let's say everybody had the time and explained what they believe is the way they are supposed to deal with people with different strongly held beliefs from theirs. And we now have those all out. Now what? They're not the same. Now, they're, now I have those differences to deal with and not just the differences on the subject matter. It, it, it actually it didn't it didn't evolve in that way. It was like oh I'm I'm now willing to engage with a very real um, uh, logistical differences that we have because sometimes it's the resistance to even dealing with the fact that we have a difference. It's just like oh no I need I need to say that like I need to approach this in a very specific way. But you can get me to see that I need to like actually right. open my approach that I'm able to like. To, to be more willing from whatever my faith standpoint is to engage in the question itself. The reason I'm staying on this and will stay on others is I have got to be able to process the yeah. suggestion and see what it means in practice. And so I have to work several rounds of this until I can imagine what I would do differently because of what she's saying. So I'm not picking on you. I I'm, I'm uh, e eager to try to play out the implication of what you're saying. You are modeling the thing that he was saying to do. But assume yeah. we move forward in that way in my hypothetical moment. Assume, yeah. assume I can help people say, look, we're not going to make any progress on this question until we understand each other's notions of how to have conversations about things we believe that are very different. And we each have different ways we believe it's appropriate to have interfaith, let's call it, but in, it, it, it's not necessarily about their religious background, it's around their moral reasoning. And the, each person has a different way, whether they are religious or not, of ex interchange on a moral argument. Yeah, that, that, so I think you've taken it and made it bigger than, than what he was actually saying would help. Okay. What he was saying is, if someone in that moment said to me, if they could ask a question or two that could help me frame that point 
in a different way, literally in that moment. Matt opened up the discussion. He was like, oh, okay. I, I, okay. the sticking point was for me as an individual. The sticking point was for me. And so if a, if a facilitator could recognize that that was a sticking point for me right. and get and help me speak to it in that moment, not broaden it up and have everybody do okay. it. But That's you, 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 um, everyone in this room undoubtedly has been in a version of this conversation <laughs> where things come to a full stop when someone says, I don't believe the same as you. I don't think the reasons for doing things are what you say. And I am not open to persuasion because that would mean rejecting my fundamental beliefs. Now here we all sitting here and I'm still here with the job of trying to generate an agreement. So maybe I can reframe the question. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to do this at all. Or maybe there's some other wording of the, of the, of the style of the interaction that everybody has to agree to first before we can take on the substance of, of the issue. Yeah, I, um, so I would argue, kind of going back to what Dr. Alvin said a minute ago, the idea that in most of our um, conflict transformation circles, ideas that one of the things that comes up is you can only speak for yourself. And when someone says, God says this, I believe it, this is the way it has to be because this is what God says, I would argue they're kind of not speaking for themselves. So I would suggest saying, would it be fair to reframe and say that you believe that God says this? Can you explain why you believe that God says this? So that's a slightly different version of, don't give me God's reasons, give me your reasons as you understand it for why what God has told you ought to be your stand on this. Yeah, I think there's a fundamental difference between saying, I believe that God says this about this thing, and God says this. What, in, in legal... In a legal context, when we're arguing about rights, somebody says, well, the Constitution says it. Rights come from the source. And legal scholars or people in a legal argument expect to debate what the Constitution does or doesn't say on that question. But they all know that that's the game they're going to enter when we try to define whether a right exists in their shared community. But in this kind of free-floating context, we're not saying, what does the law say? We're saying, how should the law be changed? Someone's, someone's going to say, well, the, the shutoffs are enabled by state and local law. We, we have law on this. What do you, what do you, what do you, it's, not, it's not a question of its legitimacy. We have a law. There's a state enabling law, there's a local statute. The uh, uh, water authority works under the statute. That's why they can shut off the water. And if someone thinks you shouldn't shut off the water, go get the state legislature to change the enabling law or get the municipal government to pass a different ordinance. I might say, because I'm afraid if I run out of time, I wouldn't get to say it. In Philadelphia, they passed the first ordinance in the United States that says if people can't pay for their water, you can't shut off the water. You have to have a program of assistance to anyone who misses two bills where you sit with them and say, well, if you pay at least $5 a month, we won't ask you for the money you owe. And if you pay the negotiated amount, which is a tiny fraction, for six months, we'll forgive the debt, the old debt. And then we'll work with you on a new payment strategy. Oh, and by the way, we're going to have an adjustment for income. First, first statute in America. Baltimore just passed one a few months ago, later. You're going to start to see this throughout cities in the United States where water sewer rates are going up because in older cities, there's no way to pay to rebuild the systems. We used to have federal grants that would go to big American cities 
to cover 80% of the cost of building and rebuilding sewer and water systems. We have zero dollars now in grants and aid for water and sewer systems in older American cities. And states did not step in, I promise you, and make those same sorts of assistance to municipal governments. So they only have rates. And if we could have progressive tax, why can't we both have low-income assistance programs that work directly with people? Yes, you're going to have to hire some staff to run those programs. And they're going to have to sit and meet with people and figure out what the problem is and work out a payment scheme, but not for the full amount that keeps increasing. You, you stop adding interest. At some point, you cancel the old debt, and then you work out what's going to be the strategy for what they pay. And they may pay 30% of what somebody else pays for as long as their income is at a certain level. But the issue is, how can you get to agreement on that kind of a policy change, which is what happened in Philadelphia? There's no precedent. It's not, and, and when we tried to have this conversation in Detroit, the legal folks said you can't have differential rates under the state constitution in Michigan. And they then now have spent an immense amount of time saying only with an amendment to the state constitution could they do this. Because there's some language in their law that says everyone must be treated equally. Everyone must pay the same amount for things like fees and taxes. And then yet somehow they have progressive tax, but not progressive fees. But the issue is, imagine you're in this kind of conversation. You're trying to get a consensus, because if you have all the representatives and they all agree, there isn't going to be anyone to fight this when the people in the consensus group who are the actual decision makers propose it. And they'll propose it because they know nobody's going to be against it because they all were represented in the conversation about getting the agreement. That's why I'm trying to get consensus, not just because it's nice. I'm trying to get an agreement to empower the disempowered. Now, I know that people who come from an organizing background think that mobilization and organization requires building a large enough constituency because you need something to attack those in authority in a way that they will have to give in. I'm not, I'm arguing a very different logic. And the problem I have is a lot of the groups behind the effort to stop water shutoffs are faith-based groups. And when we engage them in policy conversation, we hit this dead end. Because everybody doesn't share the same faith, or everybody doesn't share a willingness to justify policy change with reference to their faith, or the sources of their faith. And I'm trying to figure out a general strategy for how to, let me get some others that haven't had a chance. Uh, how to approach this. If the thought occurs to me that in our country, could you speak up a little? Oh, I'm sorry. So the thought occurs to me that in our country we have this idea of the separation of church and state. Silly idea. I know. <laughs> and with the, being in seminary that I would be against that, but I'm, I'm very much for that. So I would suggest that perhaps we could appeal to that. So while not discounting someone's faith for their reasons, I liked your question that you put earlier. Okay, so you're saying that God tells you this. What is what you understand God is saying about this? Can you put that in a way that those of us here who don't share your faith could understand? Or, or something in it? Okay, but let, let me just try a different response to mm -hmm. what you're saying. I, I want to take the idea, mm -hmm. but it would take me in a slightly different direction. Okay. It would be, it doesn't matter why you believe it. 
let's just talk about what you believe and present it in a way that you think everyone else in the room can understand. Okay. Now, that doesn't say they can't reference their faith. Mm -hmm. But I, if you get each person to share this with part of this responsibility for coming up with something that the whole group could agree to, when I say to them, well, you've already heard that when you say God says so, I lose some opportunity here to get other people into this agreement. Mm -hmm. So put that aside. Could you say what the reasoning is, mm -hmm. whether you get it from the sacred text or whether you get it from your communication with God or wherever you get it, could you just say why you think people should have a right to water and why that should supersede the need of the agency, which is not to say nobody should pay for water. People should pay for water according to their ability to pay, and that ability might change over time, and so we have to have some way of accommodating that. Would that come close to what you're saying? I'm not asking them to say what they think God said to them. I'm I like what you're saying much better than what I was trying to get to. <laughs> need more pushback. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you're working with a coalition of different representatives and you're putting together like a package of reasons and justifications, I don't see why you couldn't put in that, like that for some people it's because quote unquote God said so or whatever way it is, it is that they frame it because they're not actually disagreeing with the decision, they just have a different way they're coming about it, so why can't you just, if I'm understanding your question correctly, why can't you just put it in the strategy, in the package of reasoning, just include that line about God, I mean. Um, that, um, that motivation uh, when it is what most of my colleagues as mediators would translate, because they would accept it, they would translate it into, let's just focus on the substance of our proposal. They think I'm too worried about reasons of any kind. What if we just signed the damn proposal and said, everybody should be able to have water so no water shutoffs. People who can't pay at a certain point of time need uh, financial assistance, and the city government's gonna have to add money from general revenue to create a fund to support those who for a while can't pay the full amount. Rates shall be differentiated by people's last year's income. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Here's the proposal. This is what we want to have instead of the current proposal. No reasons. That's what, I'm just saying, that's the extreme version of my colleague's typical reaction to what you're saying. Reasons are going to get into trouble, Larry. Some people aren't going to like other people's reasons. You don't care about that. You just want to have unanimous support for the substance. Others won't go that far. And I would say to them, I think that's a mistake. If we can't have a good basis for it, why would people who are initially, for whatever reason, unhappy with it, going to be convinced that maybe they should support it? No, I'm saying have that have all of what you just said, but include in that proposal or whatever the draft is, include the reasons. You see what I'm saying? So okay. I'm not saying just have the same position you put out, include the reasons and the justifications that people bring to it. Okay, because but then you're back to my, the, my the, you're taking me back to the beginning of my problem, which is some people who would agree with the proposal won't sign it if it has reasons in it that they can't live with. Even though they could live with the proposal. I missed that part. Okay, okay but that's why my yeah. colleagues are saying, don't yeah. mess with the reasons. You just make your job twice as hard. <laughs> and because if they could agree to the substance, why are you fussing with trying to get agreement on the reasons? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, in almost this meta-discussion fashion, well, everyone doesn't have to agree with all the reasons. They need to understand what reasons are important to other people. But as long as their reasons are on the list, why do they have a big problem if other people have a totally different motivation for supporting it? I'm just curious whether you treat religious convictions any differently than general moral convictions in the debate. Like if someone says it's morally wrong to shut the water off, substantively that doesn't seem that different from someone saying, God told me it's wrong to shut the water off. So do you um, handle those differently? Yes. Okay. And 
And the reason is that uh, for people who are clear about their faith, many of them feel that to defend their faith, they have to disagree <laughs> with somebody else's arguments if they are justified by a different faith. Where they, people don't have, in my experience, the same reaction to moral arguments in general. I, I'm not saying there's anything good about that. I'm just saying I encounter a different kind of resistance in these kinds of public dialogues to something that is justified by someone's faith, usually without any further explanation. Just, hey, this is what I believe. I'm from the whatever group. And this is what we believe. And so, yeah, well, I'm not from your group, so I guess we'll never agree. As opposed to someone says, uh, I think this is fair. And in my world, this is fair. And therefore, I think fairness should dominate our discussion. They never reference any organized system of belief. They just say fair. And other people say, well, and then now the other side's on the, the hook to say why well, it's not fair, or uh, to give some other definition of fairness. But they, they know how to operate in that realm differently from the way they know how to operate when someone puts a flag in the ground and said, this is because of what I believe in my faith. But to build on that point, I wonder if the question of a moral imperative is the common ground. Because I think religious people can talk about their moral convictions, and I wonder if that is a place to build consensus using the language of morality. Or so how would that happen with, if you could improvise, how would that happen on this question of, so, I'm sorry, you don't pay your bills, you don't get the water? Well, I think by uh, raising questions that would more deeply Explore like, like um, wh what is it? What is it that would be wrong about people in our city not having water? And they, the answer that they give immediately is that some people get water without paying, and other people have to pay even more than they would because the system costs what the system costs. That's not fair. So the next question was, wh where do you get your sense of fairness? Where does that come from? Fair. What's wrong with what I just said? You can't see that that's not fair to have some people pay more for the same thing because other people are deadbeats? Come on. How can, what, what's the argument? What does it matter where I get it from? So is it part of, I, I don't need to cut, cut in without being recognized, but like, is it part of what you're talking about? Ask a, at some point, a need to ask people to be willing to examine where their point of compromise is going to be, right? Like, I mean, we can't help you if, if there's always going to be an argument. At some point, even a person, you're going to have to confront their willingness to compromise and their willingness to be at the table. And that, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, there are any number of ways that the scenario, these scenarios could go. And on some level, you kind of have to get to the point of like, what is it, how does your faith I need you to get past being stuck in this thing, and I need you to examine how your faith can help you move your needle a little bit. Because just literally saying, I need, I'm trying to get us to a place where we can all buy into this. How is your faith going to help you get to a place where we can make some compromise? Literally put the question to them and say like, you, all of you are preventing us from getting to consensus. Like, does your faith ask you to examine how you move the needle and get to con get to consensus? I do understand that right? point. I everybody that works with me at the Consensus Building Institute, I the first thing I try to do is get the word compromise out of their language. <laughs> and the, the, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not no, no, I just use I, compromise. That's that's not. I, I that's understand. Not how I, I just I want yeah. to particularly underscore this. In a community of people uh, studying about conflict resolution, it is a lot easier to bring my general point back to my particular case in response to this. It's a lot easier to say, you, you really would serve your own interests better if we could reach agreement in this group. Your own interests better. Not, 
you, everyone has to give a little if we're going to live in this community together. We, you need to adjust, and everyone needs to give up something. It's a lot harder to get agreement that way than it is to say, if we could get agreement, everyone is going to be better off. Everyone's needs will be met. The whole system won't have as much of a chance of breaking down. It's the value gained through consensus rather than the appeal to everyone giving something up that actually works in mediation to get agreement. Now, you have to work really hard to show people how they will be better off when someone else is better off. But to take an example of from what Adam was presenting earlier, if you look at a river like the Nile, and you know, Ethiopia says, the water that runs past our border is ours. The other dozen countries say, no, 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 no. There's upstream and downstream, and we're all sharing the same. No, we can build a dam if we want to, because we want the electricity, and we want all the other benefits uh, to our country, so we're going to build the largest dam in Africa. And Egypt, which is after them, says, you build that war, because you can't take our water. And you try to tell all the countries from the beginning to the end of the river, when more countries' water security, or when more countries' water insecurity is eliminated, everyone has more security. So the notion that you're just going to look out for yourself actually is someone could build a dam upstream of you then and, and say it's justified because of what you did. Or they could just decide to attack you, creating now instability of war caused by your inability to accept responsibility for everybody's needs having to be met. So it's not that you can't build a dam, but the building of the dam needs to be coordinated because the next largest dam is very nearby <laughs> in Egypt, and 90% of Egypt's water goes over the Aswan, and if it's blocked before that because it all goes into the, uh, to the new dam th before that, nobody's going to be more secure. So the idea of appealing, so and that's why many of my colleagues say, don't talk about the reason, just get agreement on the substance, everybody's interests will be met, no, you don't have to explain why. I think it's a mistake. I think we have to talk about reasons and moral arguments. But finding a way to do that when there's enormous variation amongst people, that's what I'm talking of searching for in terms of practice. Yeah, I think you're getting at it. Just you said something earlier here that I think gets at it and just now. Speak loud, okay. Um, it sounds like a take home, where you'd like to leave a table or a circle is everyone walks away with a sense that all of our needs were met. Right. That's, that's where, and a group can probably be down with that from the very beginning. Wow, we're all gonna walk away from here with all our needs met. I, I would like that. Or we're probably. gonna have no agreement, so don't worry about coming. Yeah. <laughs> right, so so you, I see where you wanna go, and I think that's appealing to a group that we all walk away with all of our needs met. Our most important needs. Our most mm -hmm. important needs, thank you, thank you. I think like I'm looking at these lights and it's giving me an image here. Like the top circle, the top rim, you're talking about um, different prescriptions that people have. And it's prescriptive. And, and you're at different ends of the circumference of a circle because you have different prescriptions. And then maybe if you drop down the, the cylinder a little bit, you have different uh, perspectives that give rise to those different. So there's different perspectives. And if you just stay on the um, circumference of the circle, you're going to be separated from each other. Um, so I like what you're saying about um, listening, that there's a space for reasons, there's a space for hearing the different prescriptions, there's a space for hearing the different perspectives. But what you're saying at, at the end here drops down and it doesn't become a cylinder anymore, it becomes a cone, as I see it. And at the bottom of the cone, there's this unifying point, um, which Rosenberg suggests as human needs or values. And what you're naming, if, you're, if your outcome, if the desired outcome is all of our needs are met, then I think what I've experienced in the circles I've been part of is when people can hear each other's common needs and common values and validate them across the board, validate fairness. Oh, yeah, I value fairness, too. Oh, water. I need water, too. Oh, integrity, like how I would hear um, what you're calling the moral or the religious arguments 
is a desire for a deep sense of integrity. I want to have spiritual integrity. I want to have a sense of integrity. So I think um, what Rosenberg says is there's this language of life that unifies us, and it's the language of human needs. So if you can simply affirm what you're hearing as valid, but then translate it into the needs, I think I've seen many groups come to consensus that all of these needs are important. Boom. Now you've answered her question, which was earlier like, we've got to change the nature of the dialogue. We've got to be, have clear social contracts. And the social contract would say, what we're going to go for in this dialogue is really listening for needs and coming with a win, a strategy that meets all the needs. Okay. When you're actually trying to get, to apply that, yeah. to get agreement on an environmental justice matter, mm -hmm. like, can you take people's water away from them? Mm -hmm. Can you take their home away if they don't pay the bills? Yeah. But how are we going to run the system? Yeah. If you just try to get everything to what's common, what's shared, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to talk about the trade-offs that have to happen. The, in most environmental justice cases, mm -hmm. it isn't just about affirming what we all would like the outcome to be. To actually get to that outcome, trade-offs have to be made. So someone's going to have to pay more in the prop with the problem I'm talking about mm -hmm. if somebody pays less. We could agree on a basis for doing that, mm -hmm. but we, we can't stop at the level of what's, what common need is. Mm -hmm. You have to translate that into action. Yes. And the point of taking action is going to be to distribute gains so, and losses. And it's the principles that people that can agree about that allow us to agree on how to distribute gains and losses that we need to get to in these conversations. So it's not just what's the common need. We all need to have water. We all need to be treated with respect. We all need for our community um, you know, to take account of people's differences. Fine. Now, we have to translate that into some sort of operational plan. It is going to include trade-offs. So how have you found that you've moved people, once there's agreement on these are the shared needs, right to the motivation level to move that into strategy and action. Right. By talking about actual things you can do and the reasons that justify them. And my goal is to accumulate, in answer to a uh, response to an earlier point, to accumulate the different reasons first, mm -hmm. to get them out, and, and then to ask the meta question, which is if someone has a different reason from you but they want to get to the same place, you have a problem with their reason being listed with yours. Mm -hmm. For others who weren't here to understand that there were multiple reasons mm -hmm. for doing this. In other words, I need to get agreement on the meta point, which is uh, people may have different reasons for this, but they're all important to people. Let's put them all on the list. Mm -hmm. But the list then is used to justify prescriptive action, which includes the distribution of gains and losses. Mm -hmm. You can't stop in practice if you're going to address environmental justice at the level of shared needs, at the level of principle. You have got to get to some kind of action plan. And the action plan is not going to benefit everybody equally. But if I could, you know, if I said, my reason for wanting to do this is uh, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs, does that bother anybody? Right, that's Marx. And, and the, the question is, so, oh, I'm not going to support something that's socialism. Mm -hmm. I say, don't. But could you support this plan, where we have a differential ability to pay? Uh, that is my reason. You know, your reason might be something else. So could we cumulate, explicate, cumulate, cum cumulate the reasons? If some people want to say, my faith says this, that's why I put it there. I'm nervous about going a level at deeper than that because I don't think most people are going to be comfortable taking it on. I'm the best time to I just like one quick, okay. Um, just going back to the God versus moral imperative, I, yeah. I want to clarify because you said you probably would go with, okay, you have a moral imperative of fairness and therefore I mean, that's good. I'm that's just saying that's thing. easier for people right. to deal with. Okay. But, uh, but I think part of what you also have to do is, is uh, that 
at the basis of socialism, of um, capitalism, uh, of all of these systems, are systems of belief. Yes. Are is faith. That uh, that last sentence, uh, I I don't I think everybody would agree with you. Yeah. But it's a system. They are good. Get the systems meaning, of belief. Meaning, it's a system of belief in something that isn't necessarily proven. No proof. I don't think proven is the point. If your justification for your for your reason is faith, mm -hmm. and you can't explain it any further except with reference to faith, it's a problem for people who know they have a different faith. I would rather not force that issue in the kind of mediation of environmental justice claims that we try to do. Remember, we're, we're, we're not just trying to advocate for a good outcome. We're trying to generate a process by which the actual combatants come together and agree on something themselves. And so what we have to do as facilitators of that is to have some sense of one of the bumpers on the side of this conversation where we can keep everybody on a track to get to an agreement. Uh, thank you for so, Larry, is there listening. a big reveal? So what did you do? Sorry. What, what did you do? <laughs> we stayed on the substance of the agreement, which got a lot of people very excited because they were in favor of it. The people who were quiet, and I knew we are going to have a tough time agreeing at the end, we asked them what reasons might convince them to do this. And we found some reasons in common. And so we're getting a smaller and smaller group of outliers from the agreement. And then when we turned to the ones who weren't signing on to the reasons, we said, is there anything your reasons would have you change in the substance of the agreement? No? OK. That's as, that's as far as we can go. Um, we have made an interactive role play about this with confidential instructions to each of seven or eight people who are symbolically representing these different groups. Uh, that is available should anybody want to use it in their own uh, teaching, training, uh, learning. Uh, the goal is to get people to the specific discussion of the strategy for solving the environmental justice problem and force everyone to have to confront what should be the basis for a consensus on this question. Thank you. Thank you. Just like you uh, thank you, Larry, very much for processing this with us. And the um, challenge in this work, and I believe the reason we call it conflict transformation, is because many of you, as leaders as faith leaders will be in this position where you are facilitating between uh, communities of faith and other aspects of the community, other partnerships. So the importance to be able to think through this kind of interaction and how it is we might begin to facilitate this process to reach very concrete actions that have to take place in our communities. So I believe that many of you are going to end up in the very role that Larry was in, in that setting. So thank you again. Um, hope you can stay for lunch, both of you, and have more in, uh, conversations. Um, Mike, is there anything you want to say about lunch back there? No. <laughs> okay, it's going to be delicious. It's a vegan lunch. And um, at 1240, um, Taslin has... Taliesin. Taliesin, thank you. Yep. Allison has um, volunteered to take as many would, that would like on a um, meditative walk and maybe could meet in the hallway at um, 1240 for those of you who would like to get outside and have some time of silence and um, enjoy a bit of nature. So, yes, go ahead. About that. I just want to say that um, I'm a trauma-sensitive meditative walk leader. So uh, it, this will be a very gentle and trauma-sensitive approach to a meditative walk. So um, if we could uh, move to the back and start getting lunch, it would be great.